All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome. My name is Kathleen Kierleis. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Administration and Finance um, here at UMass Boston. And I want to welcome everybody to today's Lunch and Learn. Um, we've got a full agenda of items regarding our campus um, planning and construction projects. You have $173 million capital budget for the next five years. And part of that's being implemented this very year. And so uh, I will turn the um, uh, program over to Mike Kearns to introduce our panelists and go over the agenda. And you know, please enjoy. And we'll have time for some questions at the end. Thank you, Kathleen. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Mike Kearns, Associate Vice Chancellor for Facilities. I want to welcome everybody and thank you for your attention to these important uh, initiatives on campus. We're going to have a presentation of planning activities, construction activities, and then an update of the HVAC improvements we're making at Wheatley and some of the other buildings. I'm going to turn the presentation over first to Dennis Swinford, Director of Campus Planning, for the planning section of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Go get us caught up here. There we are, and uh, on slides. Um, what I two things I'd like to cover today is um, under kind of under the heading of planning and sustainability here at UMass Boston. We have a new team member I'd like to introduce uh, and uh, make sure you know exactly where uh, you can get a hold of her because she is spearheading a really important aspect of our future um, for all of our futures. Uh, and then the second is to give you a quick update and almost a teaser. Uh, on our progress on the campus master plan update. So our new team member, um, us, our sustainability and resiliency planner is Grace Hotop. Uh, Grace joined us from uh, Binghamton University where she received a graduate, pro graduate degree in sustainable communities. Uh, and sure, primarily responsibility is going to be leading sustainability uh, efforts here on campus, uh, work with our chancellor's committee on sustainability, uh, report to leading by example and for everybody that may not know what that is that is the state's program in which uh, they have made resources available for all of the state institutions and policies on how we are going to get to the governor's um, uh, um, uh, goal for sustainability the next one is uh, reporting on stars stars is a, a campus uh, sustainability reporting system that is um, administered by the American Society for Higher Education, Sustainability and Higher Education, and then create new sustainable uh, sustainability initiatives, uh, initiative, initiatives on campus. Um, I have Grace's email here under her picture, uh, and then I also have today, we have started a Instagram site for sustainability on, uh, on, on at the UMass Boston campus, and it is at umbe.green. Uh, her top priorities, kind of went through this before, but let me go again, is to, to really to begin to put us in um, the caliber of the, our other institutions that have been doing STARS reporting for quite some time. Um, community engagement and outreach, making sure that our students understand that we are seeking and looking for and planning and leading a sustainable future here at UMass Boston. Um, creating, a planning, uh, creating planning for our sustainability in uh, the master plan. Uh, we are in the process of doing a carbon and energy master plan with my colleagues at the, in the facilities department. Uh, she is uh, working with us on that. Um, we are looking towards renewable, renewing our energy, our, our fleet, into a uh, battery-powered fleet, so she's helping leading that. And then, uh, of, and then the sustainability and climate action plan specifically for the campus. So it'll be taking a lot of the things that we're doing and all of the other policies that, we're, uh, that we are creating and all the initiatives we're doing and create one cohesive plan around how we are um, uh, approaching sustainability and uh, resiliency on our campus. So go to the campus master plan update. Um, I like this. This was a charge that uh, our chancellor gave our group uh, when we started our, our, our sustainability, pardon me, our campus master plan uh, working group. And the pieces that I like and the challenge of this charge is that we want to create a plan that's visionary but achievable. Uh, and, uh, and that is uh, realistic in its ambitions is, uh, is exactly what it says. 
and that's what we're about, that's what we're in the, in the process of doing now. We've been working about nine months on the plan. Uh, we've, we've had open forums and uh, opportunities for many people to uh, participate. I'll get a little bit further into that. But the important part of this slide is we've had three phases. One was kind of get to know the campus <laughs> get to, uh, and, uh, uh, and analyze the campus. The second was begin to explore alternatives on how what we want fits in what we have. And, right, uh, and now we are at the process of refining those, uh, kind of refining that final alternative to create um, uh, the final master plan. We have had um, a spectacular working group. They've uh, done a lot of work. Want to thank them for uh, all their efforts and attention to this important effort. Uh, and also tell them that your work isn't over yet. Uh, I recognize a few faces in the crowd. Uh, and also for the people that um, would like to connect with or give ideas to the master plan, please find one of these people. There are a lot of them uh, all over the campus and uh, all, all different departments. So if you have an idea, please reach out and find one and, and, and have a chat with them about the campus master plan. But just um, as a summary of the process that we've gone through, um, our working group has had six formal working sessions uh, that have been about over 20 hours of meetings. Um, we've had three review sessions. We had a uh, strategic chairs committee uh, group that, uh, the, that I was a part of, and we did three presentations to that group because what we wanted to do is make sure that the, 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 the physical plan meet, meets the strategic plan and matches the strategic plan and supports the strategic plan. So uh, that, um, that mesh that we were able to do here during this time is something that doesn't necessarily always happen at other campuses. It's wonderful that it happened here. Um, <clears throat> we had 40 different stakeholder groups uh, about 275 individuals uh, uh, participated in, in those stakeholder groups. We had two all-campus surveys that went out. We had over 1,000 responses to those. Um, two all-campus presentations, um, kind of, you know, kind of well attended, about a dozen or so. But what really was well attended and, uh, and very successful from, uh, from my point of view was our drop-in sessions that we had uh, in the campus center where we had over 600 kind of unique people, unique individuals, everybody's unique, but <laughs> a single participants uh, come, over, come over and participate in the drop-in sessions. All of that being said, we have developed four planning principles uh, that align with a strategic plan. The first one is to create a welcoming, inclusive, and health-promoting campus for, uh, for UMass Boston. The second one is to invest in high-quality, inclusive learning environments that support the university core values. The third is to create a campus surrounding that is connected. And we have a, re we have a reciprocity between our neighbors and our campus that we haven't had in the past. And then the third, or the fourth, pardon me, and this one is to some extent really important uh, because it's where Grace is going to come in, is begin to leverage our assets and our resources to support a sustainable, resilient, and nimble campus in the future. Um, part of campus planning is kind of taking, the, you know, in a way, taking it apart, taking the systems apart. Uh, our consultant team, the working group, uh, did a campus analysis for different types like building use, circulation, open space, views, and uh, kind of took the campus apart, looked at it in different types of systems, if you will, and came up with this, um, this graphic that really begins to show the important aspects of, of how we want to create, how we wanted to create a campus master plan. The first piece is to strengthen connectivities. Uh, not only between our buildings on the campus, but our campus with our neighbors and our campus with the larger city and region. Design a welcoming experience. Um, we have a lot of individuals that come to campus for the first time. Um, we have every day we come as fa faculty, staff, and students. We'd like to create a place where there is a welcoming experience on campus. Leverage the waterfront. I think we've heard the chancellor say, take, um, I think he says something like, uh, take, uh, take advantage of our locational endowment. Um, and what we want to be able to do is, you know, 
have people understand we have a beautiful campus, a beautiful setting, and a great place to learn and work. And then secure a flexible future. What that means is to begin to identify places that we can grow and change uh, as the future grows and change, and making sure that it's flexible enough so that we can meet unknown challenges uh, in the future um, with our plan. With that kind of framework of uh, analysis, the team uh, explored three different options. I'm not going to go over these options. This is kind of the tease. Uh, and the tease is coming up at the end of um, October, we're going to have a series of on um, a series of open campus Zoom sessions. So it's we're going to we're going to do this virtually, uh, just to make sure that we have a lot of participation. Uh, and our open campus webinars will be Thursday, October second. Pardon me. Thursday, October twentieth, uh, at ten a.m. and another one at three p.m. We'll make sure that an all-campus announcement goes out with those links. So everybody here that wants to hear more about where we are, uh, there's a lot more to tell you, tell you about the Campus Master Plan. Uh, and then there are two other ways you can connect with us. We have a web, uh, a web address, masterplan at umb.edu. You're welcome to send ideas, thoughts, anything you want to that email. And the same goes to me. My, my email is uh, dennis.swinford at umb.edu. Uh, please. Uh, please send us ideas, thoughts that you might have on the master plan, because now is the time that we need to hear that. Um, along with master planning, we also begin to set up plan projects uh, in planning and, and begin to look at ways in which we can um, make change and create changes on the campus. And there are some projects that are in planning. One of our big ones and one that we're really proud of is uh, the money that we got to do the programming study from the federal government. Uh, for the Manning, Co Manning College of Nursing and Health Sciences. That was a, uh, that was a, really, uh, a really wonderful um, grant that we got with the help of our uh, senators and our, our legislature down in Washington, D.C. Um, we're working with our colleagues in student uh, activities to do a space uh, refresh uh, in, in their space here in the Campus Center. Uh, we're working with uh, athletics on Clark, uh, Clark Locker Room Improvements Strategy. Um, softball is another, uh, upgrading the softball complex is something that is in design. Uh, the one-stop uh, center down here uh, in the campus center is in design. Uh, and then we have been uh, taking the opportunity to do a lot of classroom and common space improvements. Some of the, comp some of the classrooms, uh, many, of, many of our students have commented on being uh, really pleased that we're doing that. We've done five so far. Uh, this summer, and we have another five on the books to do uh, during uh, while we're away on our um, um, break. We're looking at improving the Wheatley lobby and then also improving the McCormick lobby. But with that, the, the person that really makes it all come to life and happen, kind of, you know, out of plans, out of documents, out of books, is Carl Erickson, our director of campus construction and management. Carl. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, as he mentioned, I will provide an update on our uh, capital construction projects, focusing on deferred maintenance projects, as well as the substructure quadrangle development project, or uh, the acronym SDQD. Uh, before getting into some of the specifics, um, our project implementation delivery has, has uh, improved, which is allowing us to reduce our deferred maintenance backlog. We have new architectural and engineering consultants, or what we refer to as house doctors, uh, procured and engaged. Uh, this increases the resources we need to address these backlogs. Uh, we also work closely with uh, Division of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance, uh, which has a priority on funding uh, critical repairs. Uh, we're currently uh, have 15, close to 16 million of improvements uh, completed or underway. Uh, 9.2 of that is funded by the state and what we refer to as the match by the campus, about six and a half million. The state also periodically has uh, funds available for small repairs. Uh, we've uh, been able to utilize 1.7 uh, in this program in the good thing about that program is it does not require a campus match. So those are direct funds from the, straight, from the state going directly into uh, improvements on campus. 
I've kind of grouped the deferred maintenance into four categories, building systems, infrastructure, building envelope, and space improvements. And I'll go through a few of these, uh, some in design, some in uh, construction. For the building systems, uh, we're working on a campus-wide building controls. This will upgrade our management control system and improve energy efficiency, as well as manage user comfort uh, by in changing conditions. Transform Transformer replacement and fire alarm studies are also being uh, in the study phase, and those are being uh, will come along once the study phase is complete and advance into, into construction based on those recommendations. Uh, two projects are in construction, uh, upgrade of our Healy air handling units and replacement of the domestic hot water storage tank in McCormick. The upgrade of the Healy project will be a full refurbishment of the existing air handlers units to provide new conditions and achieve design capacities. Uh, scope includes full replacement of filter medias, new chilled water coils, up and upgrade of control devices. Again, this, these projects also uh, improve our energy efficiency. And this project is awarded, long lead items ordered, and construction uh, will begin in December. On the deferred maintenance infrastructure, uh, improvements to our utility uh, pump house or saltwater pump house and increase in campus-wide cooling capacity is in uh, moving from uh, study to design. Uh, and also a harbor walk resurface restoration project, which includes lighting improvements and improvements at Fox Point Pavilion. Um, a little more detail on that particular project. Uh, there'll be a full resurfacing of the pedestrian pathway from Morrissey Boulevard all the way up to where it meets with Beacons Walk or just about at the JFK property line. Uh, another key feature is a new accessible pedestrian ramp at the Fox Point Pavilion. That, one, that ramp has been closed for some time. Uh, new stairs at the ramp, new railings at, around the pavilion, and new energy efficient lighting along the harbor walk. Um, so this is a, a, a project also funded by, with DCAM. Uh, and we will maintain access to the harbor walk. There will be some detours up onto U Drive South and then back down merging with the harbor walk. But uh, the initial, during the surface restoration phase, uh, it would be closed or detours and then some of the other work can be done with pedestrians passing along. So uh, it's good to see this project getting underway. Some of the building envelope uh, projects that are in study and we tend to take, uh, working with DCAM, a holistic view of our ex uh, programs. They like to see it as a whole as well and it allows us to prioritize and work in, within our capital plan and prioritize and get the funding secured as these programs are rolled out. There's an exterior door study underway uh, as well as a exterior facades to develop a multi-year capital plan for facade uh, maintenance and a smaller project for uh, roof replacement at the lower roof at Wheatley. Uh, two projects are, uh, one's in construction service and and supply loading dock repairs in the McCormick roof phase two. We take bids uh, next week and that will be moving into construction. Phase one is already completed and that addressed, uh, we broke it into two phases because there were some critical repairs that needed to get addressed immediately and that allowed us to uh, achieve that. The service and supply loading dock repairs will uh, just do some full concrete depth repairs, drainage improvements so that we avoid having uh, similar problems in the future and also provide some provisions for future EV charging for either grounds equipment and or vehicles. And this contract, again, has been awarded. Contractors have been mobilizing. Those of you that pass by the 150 lot will see that they've uh, set up their laydown area. And last, uh, space committee projects and common space uh, and classroom upgrades, some of which Dennis talked about. Uh, the space committee projects come from us uh, after review by the space committee. Uh, there's a process that's outlined on the uh, master plan website, uh, as well as it's part of your capital, uh, for those budget analysts out in the audience, part of your annual capital development, that you, if you have a space request need, that gets factored in so it can be reviewed by the budget department. Uh, Dennis touched upon the uh, class improvements we did this past summer uh, by uh, improving in right-sizing classrooms and their function and layout, largely by taking two small adjacent classrooms, removing the common wall, 
opened up the area, allowed for uh, optimal size seating. You can see some of the examples. Um, the particular one that you're looking at, you know, was 32 seats now to 24 seats. Again, greater space and greater access to it. Uh, that's, that was the deferred maintenance, and I'll touch upon uh, the SDQD project. And by way of background, uh, this is the last major element of our 2009 cap campus master plan, uh, and it addresses long-term inherent problems with the original design and construction of the campus. Uh, it also addresses and extends the useful life of our remaining buildings and ultimately provide a new center or quad for the campus and create opportunities for future growth. Some of the key elements of it are the demolition of the science center and pool building, as well as major portions of the central plaza, substructures repairs beneath the Wheatley and McCormick buildings. Uh, those areas are complete, which I'll note on in a minute. Restoration of the rem remaining plaza, uh, and what's important in this element is new waterproofing and drainage as that was one of the contributing factors to some of the uh, problems with the, uh, beneath in the substructure. New stair and elevator access to the Healy Library from the restored plaza. Uh, and then the new central, uh, central quad as well as a uh, parking, 300 space parking lot. With respect to some of the construction activities, uh, the sub uh, substructure stabilization which restored the sections to the, of the existing buildings, between, foundations between Wheatley and McCormick uh, to meet seismic codes. That scope is complete. It also included concrete repair, steel reinforcement, and lateral bracing, as well as overhead protection uh, for accessing to mechanical spaces, and this work is complete. This past summer, uh, we had an increased construction activity on the plaza. Uh, with our reduced summer campus population, not a zero population, but a reduced population. Um, one of the uh, changes that we uh, worked on and required shifting of pedestrians across the plaza was to close the entrance to the McCormick building to uh, redo that storefront and entry and pavers to access that. Um, as I noted, it did require periodic shifts of the pedestrians uh, to maintain uh, access across the campus. Uh, one of the items we focused with the construction team is that we needed to maintain access across at the plaza level and not take us off of the plaza to move about the campus. And throughout this, we uh, worked closely with EHS in maintaining and ensuring we had code compliant egress while there were various changes uh, underway. For the start of the uh, fall 2022 semester, we did have the McCormick uh, entrance reopened. Uh, we do continue to travel along a portion of the structural void from Quinn to McCormick before transitioning to finish pavers uh, for the entranceway to McCormick. Other activities, uh, we completed the structural void uh, from Quinn to Campus Center, and this opened up work area for building up of the quad. Um, you know, we're going from elevation 24 at the Clark all the way up to elevation 49 at the Plaza grade, and that's a 25 foot elevation change which requires uh, building up. That's largely being done with uh, the former science center which was crushed uh, and stored in lot D and lot S. Uh, we were able uh, to empty lot D, haul those materials into the quad as that process of building that back up and have lot D back open for the campus in the fall of 2022. Uh, adding an additional 375 spaces on campus. So that was a, a big effort to push to get that back for transportation services. Um, again, the buildup of the quad uh, progressed as we were hauling the materials in. It's done in a series of lay layers and then compacted as it builds up. So it'll, you'll see it, uh, for those of you following on the site camera, building up uh, over the next uh, few months and into next year. Looking at some of the uh, milestones that we're tracking towards um, with respect to the plaza, by January 2023, uh, we're, we expect are working to have additional pavers along at the entrance to McCormick. This will shorten the uh, area that we walk on the temporary surface, start to see planter beds uh, being planted uh, by, the end, by January 2023, by March. Uh, continuous pavers from Wheatley to Quinn, 
the balance of the planters around McCormick, um, Wheatley ramp access uh, shown uh, in the part near over by A, the letter A, and I would note there was one question that came in in advance of this uh, meeting asking about when will those, the doors from the inside, the south entrance are blocked. That's because that portion of the plaza hasn't been open, but throughout that there is an alternate egress that you go down the stairs right behind you, but with the opening of this, uh, those, that blocked area would re reopen. Uh, Healy exterior stairs uh, to be opened by March, and then you know beginning to see site furnishings uh, installed and available for campus use. And by June, uh, full plaza pathway between Quinn and Campus Center, no longer requiring to uh, cut through McCormick, and then Healy elevator uh, to be in service. We do continue to work closely with the construction team uh, to better these dates, but uh, these are the dates that we're working towards right now. With respect to the quad, quad will remain a construction zone uh, as they're doing the backfill and buildup of subgrade and from that elevation 24 to 49 that I noted earlier with the uh, process science crushed brick, and, brick materials. Uh, this will be followed by landscape soils, trees, shrubs, and grasses. Uh, the contractor is progressing his work from the west and backing out along the east over by the campus center. Hardscapes, pathways, picnic grove, and outlooks uh, will all advance as that work is backing out, and then the parking lot uh, at the end. I would note that similar to when we completed the campus center lawn, once that's planted, you do need a grow-in period for the uh, roots to take hold. Otherwise, we'll be going on it too quick and uh, being, not having a, a stable grass. So while it still is in the future, uh, it is important to, be, to remember that the uses that the quad will provide when it is open, uh, from recreation to picnic areas to larger gatherings uh, for movies or campus events, there will be many central uses. Um, and also lastly, if you haven't had an opportunity to view the rendering video, it's available on the facilities website or also you can get to it through the marketing and engagement website. And if there are uh, questions on the project as a whole, uh, you can email masterplan at umb.edu. If there are immediate construction related issues or questions or items to be addressed, uh, please email facilities at umb.edu or call 617-287-5450 so that we're, facilities are aware of it and can respond and address and uh, try to resolve any concerns. With that, I'll turn the presentation over to Mike Kearns. It's interesting to me, uh, I was mentioning to Kathleen before the meeting that the last time we did this live was probably January of 2020, around that time frame. It was right after I came here in December of 2019, and it was pre-COVID, obviously. And there's some people here that are, were on the facilities team back then, but you can see how much we have going on, and I'm so thankful that I have Carl and I have Dennis, but when I was standing here almost three years ago, Carl wasn't here, Dennis wasn't here, Tina wasn't here, Grace wasn't here, so we've really ramped up, and I'm really happy about that, and it's great for UMass Boston. We have so much teed up that's gonna be so beneficial for UMass Boston, so I am very appreciative of everything that's gone on so far. So the last topic for today, um, there was some, um, a lot of interest last year in the airflow at Wheatley Hall and some of our older buildings, and there was some concerns about that connection of that to the pandemic and COVID. So I wanted to remind everybody that the campus take, has taken a multi-layered approach to COVID protection. Uh, one of the first things that was recommended was upgrading the filtration in the HVAC systems. We, had, we did have COVID-19 symptomatic testing and, and um, on-demand testing, we now have on-demand testing only, which is still a benefit that everybody can take advantage of. The vaccination, for the, requ the vaccination requirement for the campus is also a critical layer, keeping everybody um, that may get COVID um, not as sick as they may get. I think it's also important to note after a couple of years of exposure to COVID, that it's been proven that HVA systems do not spread COVID. And this note is from Zara, actually, from um, the Office of Environmental Health and Safety that there is little evidence, 
in the United States and worldwide that classroom environment spreads, um, that spreads the COVID um, pandemic or the COVID um, virus or any other virus. So not, that does not mean that we need to, that we do not make things better in our buildings. So the Center for Disease Control, the CDC and ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers, which is the number one guideline for HVAC systems, recommendations were to evaluate your HVAC, HVAC systems, which Dave Torres, who's sitting in the, in the room right here today, we did that early on in the COVID pandemic, um, completed that in 2020, 2020 and 2021. Increase the outdoor air ventilation as much as possible. There are certain code requirements for that. So we open up the dampers and uh, tweak the air handling units to do that. And as we sit today, we're at 110% of the ASH rate guidelines for outside air, which is good for any building, let alone an old building. And also improvement of the air filtration system through the filters. Uh, MERV 13 filters are denser filters. They filter out more particulates. We had a lot of MERV 13 filters in our systems prior to COVID, uh, but we upgraded all of the remaining filters to MERV 13. And we continue to change those out on a scheduled basis. Back in May and June of this year, uh, we brought in an engineering firm, EH&E, the firm uh, environmental health and engineering that we use a lot, and they airflow tested a bunch of space, spaces in some of our older buildings, Wheatley, McCormick, and Healy. I won't read the stats to you. You can read them. I won't say them to you. You can read them yourself, but you can see that Wheatley performed the worst, McCormick uh, second, and Healy in pretty good shape, 86% of um, EACH, which is effective air changes per hour, how often the air changes in a room. 86% is good for any type of building. Uh, but 50% is, is uh, below our acceptable level. And you can see that um, we, we found that classroom spaces were worse off than um, non-classroom spaces. So the recommendations were to investigate the HVAC systems, get more out of them, which we, we're doing. We've done a lot of that and we continue to do so. Investigate the rooms that were below 50% of the air change rates per hour. We started with the worst rooms and we're working our way kind of up the list trying to increase the airflow in those rooms and we've been successful to some degree in all of those. And if uh, deficiencies still, um, uh, still exist, consider the HEPA units, um, high efficiency particulate air units, which um, we've done as well. It's also important to note that no interventions are required in single occupancy offices. So if you've, been, if you've seen some of our presentations in the past, we've developed short, medium, and long-term plans. So I'm going to go through those pretty quickly. Um, this is a picture of our R2-D2 HEPA unit. Um, this is the air change per hour improvement. It's a supplement to the actual HVAC system. So some of the short-term recommendations were to rebalance areas. I've spoken about that. Fix controls. We have a lot of things that are broken, as you can imagine, over 50 years. So. As we encounter those, we fix those as we go. We've done a lot of improvements there. We've deployed 45 of these HEPA units to the worst classrooms in uh, McCormick and Wheatley to improve the, the airflow um, statistics and the airflow performance. A medium term, we, we um, commissioned retro commissioning studies in Wheatley and McCormick. It's a really iterative process. As you can imagine, there's the complex systems there are 14 air handlers in the Wheatley building alone and hundreds of uh, variable air boxes and thousands of control points. So a lot of back and forth between us and the engineers. A lot of their findings as they were going, we started implementing and, try and making the improvements. Again, it comes down to controls, uh, air balancing, and making sure the equipment's working properly. And as, or mis as more issues come up, this isn't the end of the journey. It's kind of a never-ending journey. As issues come up, we just continue to address them. Um, longer term, in in Wheatley, I mentioned there were 14 air handlers. Two of those served the classrooms, AHUs uh, 1 and 6, or H and C. They're called H and C in the Wheatley building, 1 and 6. So in our capital plan for this year, um, we parked money in there to re re replace or rebuild those air handlers so that we'll have better air handling equipment servicing all the classrooms in Wheatley, which is, was our worst targeted area, as you saw early in the presentation. That project is approved. It's, it has started. It's moving. It's in planning and it's moving into design. Part of the mission as well is, you know, the air handle is at the beginning of the stream, the diffuser is at the end of the stream. We have to make sure there are no obstructions between, so we need to trace that out. And reconnect ductwork, get rid of any blockages or whatever may be the issue, and obviously fix the controls, the thermostats, and, 
it's a more a control is more like an advanced thermostat where we can read and modulate and change um, the settings on it from back in our for the facilities offices. Longer term, um, you, I mentioned before that we submitted a I thought we thought a very strong proposal. Dennis's team helped out a lot, and Carl for a major renovation to Wheatley first and second floor. Uh, we called it the um, Wheatley Learning Hub of the Future. That would have been a major renovation to all the classrooms, HVAC systems, lighting, et cetera. Uh, it's a very competitive process with DCAM. All of the state agencies are vying for this money. There are, I think, 74 different state agencies, something of that magnitude that go after this money. Uh, although we submitted a very strong proposal, we did not get the money this year, but we had a a um, feedback session with DCAM, and they gave us a lot of strong feedback, which we're going to add to our proposal this year, strengthen it up, and resubmit it. Um, in conclusion, I want to thank you again for the time, your time, and your attention to these important issues to the campus. Um, separating air quality and air flow, they are two separate issues. So, any air flow issues, as always, send a work order to facilities or give us a call. Any air quality issues, sent to EHS and they'll check that out and if we need to be brought in we will join as well. So with that, I'd just like to open it to questions. All right. Once again, thank you. A oh, question, yep. Yeah. There was a there was a campus wide meeting last week that had some trouble with Zoom. So um, working with IT, the decision was made yesterday that the YouTube link uh, would be a better medium for this. An announcement was sent out yesterday, and I apologize if you miss it, but this is, this is on YouTube, and it, I think it's being recorded and can be, can be Megan's nodding, so it's being recorded and can be, be viewed later. Any other questions? Well, I hope everybody feels as positive as I do that we have a lot of great things building up here at UMass Boston. We're, We've teed up a lot of work that's going to improve the campus, and SDQD is in the future, but it's not too far off in the distant future, and it's going to be great when that's done. So thank you very much.